I'd like to uh, turn it over to Ken Condon from Writing in the Zone. Ken? Thanks, John. So, hey, everybody. I'm so glad you could make it. Um, we're kind of getting our, uh, our act together as far as being a little more slick and, you know, getting a webinar instead of just a meeting. So I'm really uh, hope that you'll uh, shoot me any suggestions you might have. Um, so, yeah, I was going to start off with one of the topics that is universally uh, requested when it comes to my students for street training. Um, and even I've had requests for people on the racetrack about just, you know, how do you ride a motorcycle slowly without, you know, falling over or and certainly getting freaked out that you're going to fall over. And there are some specific techniques for how to do that. Um, and the other part of it is that right now, if you're like most people, you kind of dread it. Um, or you're the other half, which is that you get excited about it. You kind of find opportunities to, to make tight U-turns because you've practiced and you've it's a challenge and it's something that you can really, uh, uh, if you master it, it's really quite, uh, quite satisfying to do. Uh, so I've got a whole bunch of notes here and uh, so I'm gonna follow along. Uh, please make uh, notes about questions you have and uh, we'll put those in the comments and John will uh, read them off uh, toward the, at the end of the, of the session. Um, and I'll go through my thing here because it's, I have a couple videos and, uh, and some slides and I will share my screen with you when that's, when that's appropriate. Um, well, let's start right away. Uh, so oftentimes we think about slow speed uh, maneuvering as a U-turn in a parking lot or you, know, you missed a turn out on the road, you know, there's a tag sale and you saw something that was pretty interesting and you wanted to do a U-turn and swing around. And oftentimes we end up paddle walking or, you know, hanging on and just sort of getting ourselves turned around. And uh, there's a better way. And there are those caveats to that too, and I'll talk about those. Um, but it's more than just U-turns. It's also things like um, if you're in hairpin turns, really slow ones, like, in, like I mentioned a lot of, about riding in the Alps, that there are, there are times when you're going slow enough because the turns are so tight. Now let's say particularly like uphill hairpins um, that sort of spiral up. Those, you, you use a lot of the techniques that are used in a parking lot doing U-turns, um, downhill as well, I mean, it's uphill and downhill. Uh, usually, you know, again, the tighter the turn, like if you're doing right-hand turns, those are tighter if you're riding in the right lane than if you're riding you know, from Britain and you're in the left lane taking a right-hand turn. Um, so it's not just U-turns in a parking lot. It's also when you pull out of a driveway or the shopping center and you've got to make a tight turn and stay in your lane. And that's a case where if, if you have to take a right-hand turn out of a parking lot into the right-hand lane and not cross over the, the center line into the oncoming lane, that's another opportunity to use these techniques. I see a lot of beginners who really, they dangerously swing out toward that middle lane, uh, the oncoming lane, at, at when they just are pulling out to the, from, you know, to a right uh, into the right-hand lane. And, uh, and that's, again, this, so it's more than just doing U-turns. There's a, the MSF has the, the figure eight box, and it's usually the dreaded figure eight box, uh, even for instructors, because um, when we were instructors, when I was an instructor 25 years, uh, the U-box, the U-turn uh, box was kind of a, a dreaded thing for the newer instructors. And it, it took them a while to kind of get it. So that's one thing to consider is when we start talking about practicing is, um, you know, I've been doing it for years, practicing it for years, and so that's why I can do it. Uh, but even so, when you're out in, in, in the heat of battle and you have to make a tight turn and you try to do it and there's a drop off a shoulder or something, uh, you know, it's hard to actually pull off the perfect U-turn. But you practice and you get it so that you can, you know, physically master it. And then, uh, then if you, you know, are in a situation where really you got to ride this thing around and you don't have time to, to you know, paddle walk around. And there are, are opportunities where, uh, or I should say, times when uh, not being able to make a swift U-turn can actually be life-threatening. Uh, the MSF talks about it as a convenience um, skill because it builds confidence, but it can just as easily uh, kill confidence, you know, when you're on a big bike and you got to make a big U-turn, you got a passenger. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that can really um, 
you know, kind of kill that, you know, the fun of, uh, of having to do a, you know, a, a tight maneuver. Um, there's also, you know, I'll talk a little bit maybe about uh, off-road riding and ADV riding because slow speed riding is what it's all about. I mean, you're not doing 40, 50 miles an hour. You're doing 15, five, eight miles an hour on a big bike and you're bouncing over rocks and roots. Uh, so slow speed maneuvering, all this stuff here applies to that. Um, so let's start off now that we've kind of defined what I'm going to talk about when it comes to slow speed maneuvers. Uh, is let's just talk about the physics of, of stability. And so why do people fall over? You know, why does a motorcycle fall over? Well, if it's rolling, really anything above, she's even like eight miles an hour, uh, you can jump off of it and it's going to keep going on its own. Now, eventually, especially at eight miles an hour, it'll pretty quickly fall over. But it's all about just speed. If you were able to maintain eight miles an hour, it would, it would go quite a ways. It would start to drift at that speed. But if you get it up to 20 you know, miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, you could jump off and the thing would keep going until there was some factor that caused it to, um, to slow or to uh, start to, to drift and then it would go off the road. Um, so knowing that speed is, is stability as really a general speaking it's just speed is stability now knowing that when you're doing slow speed maneuvers we don't have the speed I mean, you know if we try to do a tight u-turn at at 15 miles an hour you're not going to make it you're not going to make a tight turn you're going to make a turn but i wouldn't call it tight and so this the speed is your friend uh but speed is also your enemy when it comes to trying to stay within the confines of a particular um turn a radius um so what is a stable speed? Now that's different for, for every motorcycle. On my Tiger, I can do four miles an hour. Uh, at least that's what's displayed on the, uh, on the speedometer. And four miles an hour, I can get it down to three and it gets a little, you know, a little bit kind of felt, you know, the stability goes away a little bit too much, but four miles an hour. And at four miles an hour, I can do a pretty good U-turn. Now, even at that speed, if I want to make a really tight U-turn, uh, there I have to, uh, you know, pull out more skill. Um, uh, so four miles an hour, I can do like the, the typical, you know, two parking spaces, uh, you know, U-turn or circle, and that's not too bad. Um, but when it comes to speed and stability, that when you're going really slow, it's any little hiccup is going to be extreme. So if you're going four miles an hour and you touch the front brake, heaven forbid, don't ever do that, um, you're going to stop. You're going, or you're going to lose, you know, two miles an hour, like instantly. So that's, that's one thing that's an extreme example. Another one is if you just, you know, chop the throttle, like you try to, you know, on a notchy throttle, which most motorcycles have, is that you try to like feather the throttle off and it just lurches. You're going to lose that at least one, maybe even one and a half or two miles an hour. And at two miles an hour, I don't know, there's not much stability there at all. So your drive has to be constant. It has to be steady. And so that's, that's rule number one, it's, is you have to have a steady drive. And what I mean by that, you can say steady speed. Um, that's fine, uh, but it's, it's a drive. It's sort of what the momentum is forward and the wheels are spinning a, a little bit, four miles an hour, believe it or not, that's enough. And with the motor, I'll, I'll throw this in there too. If you rev the motor just a little bit, the crankshaft uh, spinning gives you stability as well. Uh, so, and you'll hear when I show a video later, you'll hear me kind of revving the motor a little bit while I'm slipping the clutch. So this, now you've got speed. Okay, you've sort of determined what your speed can be um, for stability. And now you have to control that speed. Now at a tight U-turn, I'm gonna be going slower than first gear. That means I have to use the clutch. Uh, so friction zone, if you've, you know, the MSF term, slipping the clutch, um, feathering the clutch. There's a lot of terms with it. Riding the clutch. These are all terms that have been used, you know, car driving. And uh, surprisingly, a lot of people, you know, some people don't know what slipping the clutch is if you've never driven a standard car when you were, you know, younger or whatever. Um, but that's what we're talking about is, is the clutch isn't fully out and it's not fully in. Uh, so you've got to control the speed. So if I'm going slower than first gear, I have to be in that friction zone. So on the Tiger, it's about mm, halfway, give or take. And if you think of the clutch with numbers, you know, out is five, 
in four, three, two, one, zero is all the way in. You can sort of measure that uh, and get an idea of where your bike, um, where that where that friction zone where it starts to transfer the power from the motor to the drivetrain. That's not necessary, but it's just again, it's a way to kind of put wrap your head around it. Um, so slower than first gear means slipping the clutch. Now to control speed more, uh, a lot of people think that it's the throttle. The throttle really is the last thing you want to rely on when it comes to slow speed speed control. Because again, I don't know about you, but really most motorcycles I've ridden will not handle a really super smooth buttery on and off at a really slow speed. So I can't rely on that. So I will stabilize the throttle. I will keep it locked in a position that's just keeping it slightly elevated so that I guarantee I don't stall. Because now remember I was saying about speed, uh, uh, about stability. If I stall the motorcycle, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go to zero miles per hour. And that's, as we know, is, is gonna fall over unless, or if I put my foot down, hopefully not. Um, so I'm going to set the throttle and I'm not gonna reuse that as my, as my speed control. Uh, I'm gonna use it as a tool for not stalling because I'm using the clutch. That's what's really gonna do my speed control. So throttle is set speed, and the clutch is, is you know, slipping so that I, I keep the, uh, the drive forward without uh, any risk of, of uh, stalling. Now I will throw in a little tip here, is that for slow speed maneuvering, and I use this off road too, is I will choke up on the throttle. So if your throttle tube is, is like this and here's your control pod, uh, you know where your, you know, your turn signal is or your high beam or whatever, uh, you know, choke up and then I, I sort of anchor this part of my finger and this part of my thumb right up against that, um, the, uh, the uh, pod. Now, if you've got a, you know, a, a grip that flanges up, which a lot of them do, I'll actually put my finger up on top of that control pod and it, it anchors it so that if I hit a bump or something, I don't, you know, it's not all sloppy. Um, it just, it works great and I do it a lot. It's just instinctively now and especially off road because I really want to feather that throttle, but hitting rocks and bumps and everything, I just kind of put that, that particularly my forefinger, uh, up on that control pod. So again, that's about controlling the speed. The last thing about controlling the speed is the rear brake. Remember I mentioned the front brake, don't touch it. It's like a trigger. You know, don't put it on, your finger on that trigger. It will, it will hurt you uh, at those speeds. Uh, dragging the rear brake, however, is a way that you can, um, you can add more refinement to your speed, uh, your speed control. Uh, it also has another added benefit of it kind of gives the drivetrain something to pull against. So if you think of it that way, you've got a drive shaft or a, a chain and you're, you know, you've got that, you know, clutches in the friction zone, throttles halfway on, you know, on enough that it's not going to stall and it's pulling forward and you're kind of pulling back with the rear brake and it kind of puts that tension in the, cha in the chassis and that adds more stability. Uh, so again, you, we're using it for speed control and it happens to have a, uh, an advantage of stability as well. Now, I personally have developed this technique that I don't know, I just started doing it, feels comfortable, is I pulse the rear brake and it gives me this sort of like, you know, am I good and you know, adjust? And, okay. So I can actually pulse it and I get a, a even better feel for adjusting my speed and keeping it at four miles an hour. Now I can drag it, which is a way to, you know, just keep it smooth. It's fine, you know, and I do know people who are really good at tight U-turns and they don't use the rear brake. I know Erin Sills who did the uh, parking lot course. She's a land speed record holder. She, uh, uh, we did a, um, some tight U-turns and she was awesome at it and she didn't use the rear brake. And so it can absolutely happen. Um, so that's, those are, I mean, just recap already. So stability, speed is stability. Three, four, five miles an hour, depends on your bike. Uh, steady, constant drive, and then speed control. Throttle set, clutch in the friction zone, rear brake, try it. Uh, now variables that interrupt drive. And we talked about one of them, which is the front brake. I mean, the front brake's too powerful. Um, I will say another part of this, and this is, does, this is, this whole section here is just about uh, riding slowly. Now we've done that. We're in traffic and there's, you know, people slowing down in front of us coming to an intersection. And we know we don't you know, put our foot down every three feet. We sort of roll, roll, right? Uh, so it's not that difficult. But you know, if you're sawing your handlebars a lot, that, that's an indicator that you got a lot of tension 
and your eyes are probably not really up where you can get better, uh, better balance. So if you try to keep your eyes up and then try to relax and slow down that sawing, trying to get, keep the balance. The reason that, that you're sawing like that is because the uh, contact patch of the front tire, you're moving it left and right. You're actually counter steering in a very slight way that if you, uh, if you turn it right, it's gonna have you go down. It's the same thing as, as, as counter steering. Um, so that's why you're doing it is you're trying to keep the center of gravity or the contact patch and the center of gravity in line. Um, and it's just a natural thing to do. You don't have to think about it, right? It's, you've been doing it since the day you rode, rode a bicycle. Um, another little tip I'll throw in there again, this is just about riding slow. We're not talking about turns. Is, um, is that if you're coming to a stop, I get a lot of students that'll come to a stop and they lurch. And it's like, well, why does that happen? And why, of course, it's, it looks like a rookie move. You know, if you had a passenger, you're banging helmets and, uh, and you don't want that. Uh, so how can you avoid that? Well, think about the tools you're using. You're using typically both brakes, uh, but one of the brakes is, is, a, your, what your, is your stopping brake and the other brake is your, is your control brake. So which one is that? Well, the stopping brake is your front brake. It's got the two big discs. Usually they're the bigger, uh, more powerful brake on the front because of load transfer. And, um, uh, and the rear brake is small and it's, it doesn't have nearly as much stopping power. So when you're coming to a stop at a stop sign or a stop light and you find yourself lurching, it's because you're hanging onto the, rear, the front brake too long. So taper off the front brake and finish the, the stop with the rear brake, okay? So that's slow speed control coming to a stop. And if you're finding yourself having to hurry up and put your foot down, that's another uh, typical thing that happens when you are using the front brake all the way to a stop, all right? So think about the power, the brakes, they're different. They have a different uh, purpose and they have different power. Uh, one's more, is easier to control and then the other at slow speeds and that's your rear brake. Uh, another thing that can inter interrupt your drive, uh, and we're talking again just about going along, is again, I mentioned relying on the throttle. It's jerky, blah, blah, try to keep it smooth, good luck with that. Um, here's another thing is pumping the clutch lever. Now this is a, not bad, you're going, you're going straight, you know, and you, you kind of slow go, slow go, slow go. More times than not, you can keep, you can um, not squeeze so far and not release so far. Um, so when, when you're doing that and you feel like you need to, it's just, just do it less and you get more of a steady speed. The uh, riders who tend to squeeze and then let go, squeeze and let go, uh, they're, the most, they're, they're the most tense. They're the ones that are really kind of having a hard time um, with, with you know, just the instability of going slow. Uh, I mentioned stalling. Don't stall. If you stall, you know, that's, that's something that you know, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have to put your foot down. Uh, not a big deal if it stalls, just put your foot down and then, you know, you know, squeeze your clutch, press your button and go again, you know. Uh, a lot of rookies will not know what to do. They get flustered when they stall. It's like, whatever, you know, squeeze the clutch, press the button and go. Uh, not enough throttle, I mentioned that. Uh, so you got to kind of mm, get that throttle so that it's up so you don't stall, you know, because again, that will interrupt your drive. Uh, and I mentioned also a abrupt clutch work. And that goes back to the whole, you know, in and out, in and out sort of thing. Uh, so slow speed, sl slow speed practice. And we do this before, depending on the, the, the student, but before we even start working on U-turns, I just want students to show me that they can go in a straight line really slow. So I walk next to the, the bike you know, not a fast walk, but a, you know, a decent walk, not a big deal, four miles an hour. Um, and, uh, and I have the rider just stay next to me as best they can. And so it's, and I have them use the same technique I just talked about. Um, so throttle steady, slightly elevated, uh, clutch in the friction zone because you're going slower than first gear, eyes up for balance, and drag in the rear brake. Great, you doing it slow and in a straight line? Excellent, all right, let's throw a turn in there. So let's talk about that. Uh, we will, and that's, uh, and again, just do that first, you know, just in, particularly if you're helping somebody who's new to riding and just start at the beginning, always build, you know, building blocks are always the way to, that you wanna approach uh, training. So now that we've got the slow speed straight line stuff going on, 
uh, and then it's time to do a turn. And you can sort of say, well, okay, I'm going four miles an hour, um, straight line, I'm feeling okay. Well, once you start to make a turn, you have to lean the bike. How do you think that's gonna feel, right? When you start leaning a bike at four miles an hour, uh, immediately it's gonna feel like, oh my God, it's gonna fall over. Uh, so that's where you have to, there's a lot more to do than just you know, lean your motorcycle and to stay in balance. Um, so the U-turns, before we get into the, the technique, is think about a U-turn as any other turn. And with, if you know the MSF uh, lingo, it's, it, there's the four-step process. It's slow, look, lean, or press, and roll. Uh, and so it's the same process. Now let's walk through it. First off is the slow part is you're probably already going slow. Uh, there are two types of U-turns, and one is a U-turn, a rolling U-turn, and another one is a U-turn from a stop, where you actually make a, a, a turn without going forward. You just make it like that. Um, and I'll, I'll show, I'll talk about both of those. Uh, but you're already pretty slow. If you're not, if you're going up and you're kind of rolling up to your U-turn at 10 miles an hour, you know roughly that you need to be um, uh, at a four miles an hour. So you have to slow for that. That's the slow, that's the entry into your turn. So that's the slow part. And you slow down just like you normally would. Make sure you're in first gear. That'll, you'll stall if you try to do this in second gear, uh, a tight U-turn. Uh, and then so, you're going to then, once you're at that slow speed, you're gonna now get yourself into position for making the turn. Now let's just talk about the physics of the turn first before you actually do it. When you lean, went to turn, a motorcycle changing direction has to lean, all right? The only time you can do it without leaning, and even then it's hard, is when you're like maneuvering it around your garage. You know, you can turn the handlebars and pretty much walk it around. But if you notice, if you lean the bike in, like against your thigh and then turn the handlebars, like say to the left, you can make a tighter turn, okay? The more you lean, the more you turn your handlebars, the tighter the turn will be, okay? So it, the same thing is, works when you're riding. So as you get into the, the, the uh, turn, you have to lean. Sorry about that, but you have to lean. And then you have to turn your handlebars. Now, some people say, well, you don't counter steer under some you know, random miles per hour. It's just not true. I mentioned earlier about how you kind of counter steer yourself um, when you come to a stop. Actually, I didn't really mention much of that. Um, but you can, if you want to put your left foot down, keep that right foot on the rear brake, right? When we come to a stop and you release the front brake and you finish with the rear brake, uh, a lot of beginners and a lot of veteran riders stop with their outriggers. So both feet come down, they give up the rear brake and they have to use the front brake. Um, so to keep that right foot on the rear brake, you have to lean slightly to the left when you come to a stop. Well, you can counter steer to get that over, right? You can actually push on your left handlebar and the bike will lean uh, to the left, just like counter steering, just like how you would initiate a lean out on the road. So knowing that, I'm gonna approach the turn, I've already slowed, I now have to uh, lean, well, look and lean. So before I even start to lean, I'm gonna look over my shoulder, just like out on the road, you wanna look toward the exit of your turn. The exit of your turn happens to be right 180 degrees behind you. So you have to do like a Linda Blair exorcist head turn and swing your head all the way around. We used to call it chin to shoulder. Uh, and then that's where you want to look. Remember, where you look is where you tend to go. So it's visual direction control. Uh, also, you want to keep your eyes up to see if where you're about to go is, is safe, you know, because a car might have kind of pulled into that parking space that you were hoping to get. So eyes always, uh, always lead. You look where you wanna go and then you go there. Um, so it's now we've slowed, we've looked over our shoulder and now we have to lean the bike. So now we're gonna do that little counter steer. You're not gonna think about it, don't think about it. Only after you've kind of worked on this, then just notice it because you're doing it. You can't just go uh, uh, straight on a motorcycle and then turn to the left and expect the bike to turn left. It will lean right. Do it on a bicycle. Try to really seriously, just go on a, in, in a parking lot on a bicycle and go straight and say, I wanna go right and just turn right. You will fall left, okay? So it's, it happens at every speed. So you will be counter steering. That's gonna get the bike into the lean. I'm referencing to a turn to my left. Uh, so I'm gonna press on that left handlebar just a little bit and I'm gonna immediately turn my handlebars to the right. That's why a lot of people say you don't counter steer when it's slow uh, because they don't recognize or they don't, or don't, or don't feel the little counter steer. It's so slight that it immediately goes to a handlebar turn um, because you're going so slow. Um, and you're gonna arrest the, by turning the handlebars in, 
a lot of people think that's the, the primary reason to, you know, for it is to get you to come around the corner in, in your direction, and it is, but it's also to help you not fall over. So you're taking that contact patch and you're moving it in, in the inside so that the bike doesn't continue to lean in and fall over. So by turning in, you're putting that contact patch under, uh, in, a, in a balanced state under that center of gravity. Okay, so we've slowed, we've looked, we've leaned. Now, if I were to lean with the motorcycle right now, it's the likelihood of me falling over is much greater. Um, so what I'm gonna do is counterweight. Now, uh, imagine this, if, if we're leaning over and it's really slow, uh, slow turn, gravity is going to, it's got a great lever. If I lean with the bike, there's an awful lot of weight up really high above the seat that gravity has a great lever on. And so it's going to want to have that bike fall over. Now, if I counter that by counterweighting, counter, counterweighting, that means I'm, the bike leans this way, I stay upright. And now gravity is actually pressing the normal gravity to the center of the earth, perpendicular-ish to the surface, is going to cause the bike to, to not be levered over. It also really keeps the, uh, you know, the load on the tires uh, you know, more vertical very um, helpful off-road riding. Uh, so one thing I want to back up with is that you want to get and turn your head and get your body into position early. So if you're starting to lean in and then you move over, especially at a slow speed, you're going to upset the bike. So it all happens sort of, you look, you get your body in a counterweighted position, whether you get your butt off the edge of the seat or not, uh, that's really preference. I do because I really want to demonstrate a really tight turn. Uh, but some seats are kind of, you know, buckets and you can't really get your butt off the seat like that. So you kind of shift as much as you can. Look over your shoulder. So you're counterweighting. I'm upright this way. Bike is leaning, leaning to the, my left. I'm upright. Um, so that's the counterweighting. So I've looked. I've leaned. Got my body in position. I'm, I'm now coming around. The bike is lean. My handlebars are turned. Uh, that's the state that's going to cause the bike to come around. If you were to interrupt the drive right then, you're gonna to have to put your foot down. So it has to be, that drive has to remain. And that's where when you're trying to do all this stuff with the handlebars and stuff, anchor your finger, keep that throttle steady, slightly elevated, and have good clutch control. That's, that's imperative. And again, use the rear brake as, a, as an added way to uh, control your speed and, and the stability. And you know that's gonna really, um, that's gonna get the bike to, to work for you. Uh, um, okay, so the last part of it is to accelerate out of the turn, just like you know, slow look, press and roll. Roll is throttle. It's, it's to drive out of the corner. At some point, you want to gain as much stability as you can. So we're doing four miles an hour around the corner, probably about two-thirds, three-quarters around the corner. You're going to have to maintain that four miles an hour. Um, again, your bike might be different. It might be six. It might be you know, something else. Don't, don't like look at it and says, well, Ken, it's four miles an hour and then you fall over. Um, and so once you get about three quarters, two thirds, three quarters around, you're pretty much the bike is now, you just maintain that lean angle. And now you can start to ease out the clutch a little more and you can get yourself up to a more stable five or six miles an hour. And now you're on the straightaway. And now as long as it's safe, you can accelerate right up to 10, 15, whatever. So it's, it's a kind of progressive increase of speed. Uh, if you get on the gas or you I'm, uh, get the clutch out too early uh, or too quickly, it's just light out on the, on, the, on the road. Your bike is going to go wide. So you might be doing great halfway around and then you get, in, you get anxious and you start you know, wanting to increase your speed too early. Then you're not going to make a tight turn. You're going to go wide and you could then go off the road. So you have to have the discipline to know uh, to maintain that slow speed. And once it's safe to do so, then you can go ahead and you can start to ease the clutch out and, uh, and get your speed up because you want that stability as soon as you can get it. But it's patience, timing and intensity. I talk about it all the time. I'm going to have a t-shirt put on. Timing and intensity. It's what riding a motorcycle is all about. When you do it and how hard you do it. Uh, okay, so now we've made this beautiful turn. We've dragged our brake. We've come around. We look like a pro, you know. 15 people, all your friends saw you and go, wow, how'd you learn to do that? Uh, awesome. You did it. How are you going to be able to do that? Well, because like I always say is um, knowledge is great. Like this here is awesome, but it's not going to make you a better rider. What is going to make you a better rider is getting out there and practicing this stuff. 
uh, just a, two hours ago, I was out on my tiger and I was, I was out practicing. So I wanted, I wanted to shoot a little video, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a blast. It's good. It's fun. After a while, here's another thing about practice, because I want to talk about that, is don't overdo it, especially on a hot day. You're going slow. Your clutch gets hot. You get, there's diminishing returns once you start to practice uh, beyond what your, your stamina will allow. Uh, mental stamina as well, because it takes, you know, there's a lot of tension when you're first doing it, and that all takes up, that takes a lot, and will, it takes its toll. Um, so that's one thing about practice. Uh, I've talked about practice, straight up, uh, straight line practice, and that's the uh, just going really slow, like slow race. If you have a friend, you know, that's what we've done that in the parking lot course, we do a slow race. Um, and just, uh, you know, and that's a great way to do it. So when you're practicing out on the, um, uh, to do your U-turns, you know, do left hand, right, left hand turns and right hand turns, because if you just do circle circles, you're going to get dizzy and that's going to be a problem. So you can do figure eights or you can do a, a bunch of left hands and then turn around, do a bunch of right hand turns. You're going to find likely that you're favor one side over the other. I like left hand turns better than right hand turns. Um, I like left hand turns. My right hand turns are a little bit less you know, masterful, uh, but that's okay because we live in the United States here. You know, those, are some, those of you who are you know, watching who live in the United States, most of our U-turns are left-hand U-turns because we're right on the right lane and we missed our turn. We do a U-turn to the left. But practice both because you will, you will need a right-hand turn one of these days. Uh, what else? You have to, over time, I mean, you have to consciously relax. Now, easier said than done, I know. But when I've got the communicators and I'm coaching somebody to do U-turns, there's a point where I just have to say, breathe. Just breathe and relax, try to relax, you got this, you know? Is, again, as long as the fact that you've got this, the drive steady and you've got the clutch, which is all the clutch, throttle is set, slightly elevated, anchor your finger, clutch is set in that friction zone, slower than first gear, you got the head turn, which tells yourself that you've got this. Uh, as soon as you look away, you're a rookie. You're saying, I, I can't do this, I can't do this. You've got to prove to yourself mentally that I got this. And that you have to look where you want to go. It's a big part of it. Use your peripheral vision to make sure that things are all good, of course. And as you go into the turn, you can kind of ratchet your eyes. You can go, okay, good here, good here, eyes up all the way. Um, but don't linger. More times than not, I have to say, okay, turn your head. No more. Turn your head. And then relax. Try to relax. Breathe. You got this. It's like you're not going to fall over. Now, will you fall over? Are the things, yeah, we, we talked about that. What are the factors that will cause, cause you to interrupt drive? or to fall over, it's because you interrupted your drive. That is the simple answer, is that why would I fall over if I'm making a slow U-turn? It's because you interrupted the drive, okay? Um, or you were really abrupt with, you, you know, with uh, your clutch and you lurched and you stalled, okay? And that's interrupting the drive, it's the same thing. Um, so, uh, when you're practicing, here's another thing, just little tips, and you can try this and not. I use two fingers on my clutch. I can do that. My, the tiger's got a fairly light clutch pull, um, and it just allows me to get a better purchase on the, on the hand grip, um, and that's me. Uh, so no fingers anywhere near the front brake, all right, because what will happen, you get panicky, you're going to grab the front brake. It's a human thing to do. You, you, it'll be a knee-jerk reaction. So you, you, you just keep your fingers away from the front brake. Drag the rear brake. Rear, rear brake's your friend. Front brake is your enemy at slow speeds. Uh, okay, when you're practicing, again, find a night. You don't have to spend a lot of time at this. Don't. Don't spend a lot of time at this because you will get fatigued and you'll go backwards. You will just get frustrated and you could drop your bike, you know? So that's where you want to just kind of get out there and make it a continual practice session. It doesn't, in, like, take a ride. And all you do is you just deliberately go, oh, here's the high school. Just go in there and do a few U-turns. That's it. Move on. Now go off with your ride. If you're in a group, I mean, have it be just, I, I like doing this with my students, is we do uh, uh, follow the leader. And so you get your strongest uh, rider in your group who does you know, tight U-turns well or slow speed riding well and have them be the leader. And then just do these little circuitous, you know, things like this. And everybody just, just tags along nice and slow. And it's just a fun thing to do. And then go off for your ride. Don't go crazy, you know. Um, we want to ride, ride for fun. fun. You know, practice is oftentimes thought of as schoolwork, and, but it doesn't have to be. And, and the results are awesome. I mean, I, 
I love it, you know. Tight U-turns, hell yeah, let's do it. All right, some other considerations. I'm wrapping this up a little bit here. So we'll get the, the, the last bits and then we'll start answering some of your questions. Uh, by the way, the questions can be general after this. It can be about slow speed. And I see that some questions are coming um, and John will read those off. Uh, some considerations, camber. So most of the parking lots that I bring my students to have a slope which means that if, if it slopes, say like this direction, and I'm making a U-turn to my left, uh, I'm gonna be going uphill, which means I need more power. I, I could, the risk of stalling is greater if I'm going uphill. Now, as I come back around, say the U-turn, then it might camber, the camber might go to downhill, uh, in which case now I'm going too fast, and I have to predict that. So I have to look and see what I'm about to encounter. Because if, if I go up, I need a little more clutch and a little more throttle maybe, a little less rear brake. That's all. It's very little, very, very slight. Uh, and as you come up, and now you come up around, and now you're going to go start going downhill, you have to see that you need a little more brake, maybe squeeze the clutch a little bit. The throttle can remain the same. That's really, you could rev the, the crap out of your throttle. It doesn't matter. Just you know, scares the hell out of everybody. So just a slight elevation. But you're trying to control gravity, the effect of gravity, that would happen on a slope. And again, Two miles an hour matters, and that slope could easily cause you to uh, to increase your speed too much. Um, very steep steep slopes. You actually then it gets a little more complicated. Then we get into uh, like a lot of the off road uh, techniques where you you have to traverse. You know, so you got something like this, and you're you're trying to traverse it this way. You know, how do you how do you do that? And body position is part of that. Um, but that's a little out of the scope of of this conversation. Other things I mentioned earlier at the beginning about passengers. I have students who bring their spouse or their significant other and, and as a passenger, and we do tight U-turns with passengers. And yeah, it freaks people out. Um, but that's, that's reality is that you're going to have to make a tight U-turn with a passenger if you ride with a passenger. And so do it in where it's safe in a parking lot. Technique is exactly the same. Now you might need a little more oomph because you got a little more weight with behind you. Uh, and the camber thing is going to be even more extreme. Uh, now, what can your passenger do? Passengers pretty much need to just sit tight and be relaxed. I know, it's tough. Relaxed is, is always good. It, motorcycle, let the motorcycle do the work. You just guide it. You sort of facilitate it. Uh, passengers, same way. Uh, there's a little technique you can use if you're an active passenger, and you can counterweight slightly. Don't do much because, it, listen, it's, you're going to upset things. You be part of the motorcycle, not the rider. Sort of feel what needs to be done. But if if you were to do anything, just weight the outside edge of your seat, and that's part of the counterweighting thing I didn't mention earlier. But a simple way to think about counterweighting is you're weighting the outside edge of your seat. Okay, whether you move your butt off a little bit or not, just weight the outside edge of your seat. Uh, the, another way to look at it is to weight the outside foot peg. And if you're doing a really extreme situation, uh, that's where you you put almost a lot of your weight on the outside foot peg. When I am working with adventure riders, we do tight U-turns standing up. And so you're pretty much your, all your weight, your, your, your bike is leaning this way, your body's this way, that in, in a left-hand turn, you're, almost all your weight is on that right foot peg. And I, I have students prove it to me because by having them actually stick their left foot out while they're making a tight left U-turn. And that's the balance part, uh, point. Also use your knee and all this, there's little details that you can use. Um, but it's essentially you're trying to get that weight. So back to the passenger, if the passenger just sort of like counterweights just a little bit, and that could, you know, that can also sort of help with that balance so that, we, again, gravity doesn't have that, uh, that l as much of a lever to uh, cause the bike to feel like it's going to fall over. Uh, a couple other considerations. One is ride smart, not hard. Uh, if you have a U-turn, you're not really all that confident yet. Okay, no problem, because you're not, this takes a while is if you come to a U-turn and you have the opportunity to, to, to cheat, like let's say you're making this U-turn from here, go up there and if you can get yourself pointed, you know, 45 degrees, now you're only making a less than 80, 180 degree turn. That's easier, right? So make it easy. Uh, if you have the room, paddle walk yourself in a position and then make the turn. Um, don't drop your bike. I mean, that's, that sucks when you drop your bike. Uh, another thing is if you do drop your bike, I mean, sometimes big bikes, you just, just let them go because, oh my gosh, I mean, I've seen enough people hurt themselves trying to keep their bike up. Now, the, the tendency is to keep it up. I mean, that's the thing, even with me, when I 
I think once last year I almost dropped the bike and uh, I do an, a demonstration and I, I did catch it. But afterwards I was like, oh, geez, like, you know, it's a lot of strength. And that could have gone bad. So, um, you know, if, if, if it happens, just accept it, whatever. It's, you're going to, it happens, right? If you haven't dropped a bike yet uh, in a parking lot, you know, good for you. Um, again, difficult situations. Sometimes you have to evaluate whether the U-turn that you're facing is really something that you can accomplish. Sometimes you have to know your limits. You have to know the limits of your bike. Because uh, that's another thing is bikes, all bikes are different. I get students who struggle with their motorcycle doing a U-turn and I say, well, let me get on your bike and see what you're dealing with here. And I'd be like, whoa, that thing is the worst. That's the hardest bike I've ever ridden doing a U-turn. So keep up the good work. You're doing just as good as you can. Um, you have to know what your bike can, can manage. And don't automatically think that a big bike is, is bad at U-turns and a little sport bike is good at U-turns. The hardest bikes to do U-turns, tight U-turns on are sport bikes just because of the geometry and you're on top of them and they're, they're, they're pretty challenging. I have a slide of, of me, um, I'm doing one. Uh, one of the easiest ones I'd ever uh, done a U-turn on was a ST1300 thing practically rode itself. Um, so let's see. Yeah, if you're in a challenging situation, you know, just deal with it, paddle walk, you know, don't, don't be too proud. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm going to show you just a few things. Just to reiterate, this is a reinforcement. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back to this, to this. These are the bullet points for stability. Now, this is just really the slow, uh, slow ride uh, going straight. Um, I know I'm showing the picture of me doing the turn, but we're not talking about that just yet. So again, stability we talked about. Three to five miles an hour, give or take. Every bike's a little different. Uh, steady, constant drive. That is key. All right, that's absolutely key. Uh, and then your speed control. So you got the stability with speed. Now you have to control that speed. Four miles an hour, not six miles an hour. All right, you're going to have a very different outcome uh, using the, the uh, slower than first gear clutch and the rear brake. And then the variables we just talked. We talked about what can cause you to uh, that that drive to be interrupted. Um, so anyhow, before I move to the next slide, that's a photo of me on a ZX6 uh, back when I owned that. And it, look at me, I had to do all sorts of monkey, you know, uh, antics to get that bike to make a, a tight U-turn. Um, so here's the U-turn part is, you know, again, this is the part, the points, slow look, press and roll, develop your proper speed, uh, slow, but not too slow uh, and not too fast. We've talked about that. Remember, this, the radius, the turn you make is based on your speed and your lean angle and, and the amount that you can turn the handlebars. Um, I, I'll show you earlier a uh, little bit when I do the show you the video that I like to get myself to go to full lock. Now, that's risky because by this helps you with uh, refining your balance. Remember that contact patch is moving under the center of gravity. If you go all full lock, you can't bring it anymore. So full lock is kind of risky. You can do it if you're making a, you know, a fairly quick U-turn and then you just get full lock and then you're out of full lock and that's okay. But to get the tightest turn, it's, it requires the greatest, uh, more lean angle, slower speeds and uh, steering angle. Uh, but to do that, you have to then be able to control that drive. So slow, uh, that's as slow as you need to. Don't go slower than you, uh, any slower than you need to. Uh, and then counterweight. Remember we talked about that body position is really critical when you're going uh, slow, counterweighting. Look over your shoulder, Linda Blair. Lean, you have to lean more for tighter turns, right? And then turn the handlebars for both direction and for balance. And steady drive. Remember, if you interrupt that drive, it's gonna, you're gonna have to put your foot down because you're interrupting the stability and the predictability of the, of the uh, path that you're taking. And learn to relax. Remember, breathe. You gotta, you gotta breathe. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna wrap this up, I think. Severe consequences. Now, I talked about this before, is that when you're riding, ride smart, not hard. If you're gonna drop your bike, find an alternative if you're really pretty sure about it until you're really good at this. Uh, I even find myself out on the road and I make a tight U-turn, I go, hmm, consequences are too high. If I miss this, I'm gonna fall off the edge of this, you know, this shoulder and, and that won't be pretty. So I will then square myself up so that I make it less than 180 degrees. Um, so be smart about that, okay? Know thyself and know your bike. And again, everybody, every bike, you get a new bike, you have two bikes, 
do it on, on both practice, practice, because uh, you need that familiarity. Um, at this point, I can pretty much get on any bike and I can do a tight U-turn pretty quickly and know what that motorcycle wants. I remember I got on a student's FJR 1300 last year and, and I made sure you know, the thing when as soon as I turned, I, I leaned in, the handlebars just almost jumped out of my hand. They wanted to immediately go in. And whether that's a trait of all FJRs, I'm not sure. Um, but we, I made sure that his tire pressures were right and all that. So, um, so our, uh, uh, you know, it was just a fat way that that bike was. And then I was on a star uh, motorcycle that a woman had, and it was very cumbersome. So, you know, every bike's a little different and just know that um, light is right. If you are a newer rider and you want that Harley and it's big and all it, I don't know, man, you know, we're, I'm seeing more and more people, you know, enjoying the, the 310 BMWs and the XT 250s and the 400 Ninjas and uh, the smaller 650, you know, um, Versus and stuff, you know, and those things are a piece of cake to get around. Okay, so I guess I want to open it up to uh, questions. John, you got a few here? Yeah, I've got a few questions for you, and I'll, I'll uh, start with the oldest first. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a corona time. Uh, Ken, <laughs> the first question from Dave is, uh, he wanted you to talk about, and I know that you touched on it, is uh, what about linked brakes? Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you. I didn't have that in my notes. So linked brakes do hinder a little bit of this of control, of the total control that we're looking for with the independent brakes. Um, but uh, the manufacturers uh, have gotten smart. The early linked brakes, like BMWs, they were just, you know, they didn't, they were awful. Like they were terrible at doing U-turns with those. Um, but now they've calibrated the front and the rear brakes uh, to manage this. And I do believe, I just, I don't remember which manufacturer, maybe somebody can put in the comments for later, um, what bike it was, but they actually, dis, it disables the, uh, the front brake below a certain uh, mile per hour. And then you're all set, but you know, every bike's different. So, uh, but link brakes still, even so you use that rear brake. Yeah, you're going to get some front brake, but it's not that, it's not, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a ratio that they've uh, de designed into it. So the technique still works. It's just that you understand that, uh, that it's going to, the risk of you being jabby on your rear brake, it's probably going to be, have more significance as though you were actually being a little rough on your front brake. So again, that will, you know, be something that you have to just get accustomed to. Good question. Thank you. And uh, Ken, uh, the next question from Deb Woods is, uh, what is the difference between using the front brake and rear brake when in the friction zone? Why is the rear brake okay, but not the front brake? Uh, power. So when you are going four miles an hour, if you use the front brake, the power of the brakes are really for slowing you from speed. So it's just going to stop you. You're going to lose your, your stability because it will go from four miles an hour to three miles an hour and one mile an hour actually matters quite a bit at slow speeds. So your rear brake is much more controllable at slow speeds. It's your control brake. That front brake is your stopping brake. Okay. So that really explains it. And, you know, the front brake is designed. It's all just designed to really slow you down. A deer jumps out in front of you kind of slowing and you don't want that when you're going slow rear brake. And, uh, from Gardner gray, uh, the front wheel, tends to flop over all the way to lock. This makes me not want to turn the wheel too far. How do I overcome this? Uh, like I mentioned with the FJR, uh, I forget Gardner what you ride, um, but some bikes do have that tendency uh, and you actually, your job is to arrest it. So it wants to go all the way. Uh, you don't want it to go all the way. You have to actually uh, premeditatively uh, prepare yourself for that. So as soon as it starts to, to get out, you have to already be ready. You can't let it go past the point where you want it to because the degree in which you turn is equal to, will, will be in uh, alignment with the degree in which you're leaning. So if you're leaning a lot, you have to be turning a lot. So if you're only leaning a little bit and the bike, the, the front wheel turns a lot, it's actually gonna really upset your balance. So it's essentially, you have to arrest it from flopping all the way in. And uh, the next question uh, from John Gamel is, uh, John has uh, very little feeling in his feet due to uh, neuropathy. 
and uh, he's limited in, in using the rear brake because of the, uh, the neuropathy issue. Uh, do you have a possible solution? The brakes are linked on, on uh, his bike. Yeah. Um, try it without the brake. And the brake is optional. Like I was saying earlier, uh, you know, Aaron Sills does it beautifully without the brake. Um, because, you know, but I will say, well, link brakes, if you didn't have link brakes, I would say your neuropathy probably wouldn't uh, be a big deal because if you're a little heavy on the rear brake, it's, it's usually not that big a deal because it's a, it's not that powerful. Again, every bike's a little different. Um, but in this case, try just using the clutch and be sure to anchor your finger on the, on the, uh, on the uh, throttle, on the control pod. And then you can really keep it that way and you can just focus on your clutch. Don't try to do anything with your throttle. Just lock it and forget it. And it's all about the clutch. Hope that helps. And uh, B.B. Greenberg... Uh, asks uh, if you could address the whole slow turning uh, scenario using a DCT Goldwing. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, DCT, those of you who don't know, is the uh, auto automatic transmission. It's the one that it has no clutch and it's sort of, uh, it's, they're cool. I like those. Uh, it's going to manage it for you. They're a little bit, I don't know, not so smooth. Uh, depends. Some of the bikes, some of the D DCTs are better than others, but uh, it, you know, it's supposed to manage it. It's sort of like those of you who ride off-road, they have recluse clutches that you can put in. Uh, so it slips. It has like the clutch plates sort of slip. Uh, as you slow down, you don't, there's no clutch that you need to pull in. Um, so it's the technique I would use for that is I would be relying more on my rear brake to control any sort of, you know, inconsistencies that would happen in the transmission from a DCT. Like I say, I think they're pretty good now. And the Goldwing DCT I rode the other uh, last year at Americade, it was beautiful. I loved it. So. And uh, Ken, the next question up is from uh, DB Mill. Uh, and uh, DB asks, uh, what about moving closer to the gas tank? Does that help any in making the turn? Uh, great question. You know, I didn't put that in my notes. So absolutely uh, depending on the size of the bike and depending on your stature you know how you know, the length of your arms um yeah you have to, there i rode an indian chieftain uh, eric tro's indian chieftain from stay and safe uh I don't know, five years ago i loaned he loaned it to me the thing's huge right so it's long and the handlebars are you know this and i had to make some tight u-turns i literally had to sit up on the tank the back side of the tank uh so i was between the seat and the tank sitting on that part so that when I took the, the full, you know, close to full lock turn, I could actually do it. So absolutely, that's a technique that might be necessary. Now, I just rode, I just re uh, rode a bike this last week, I forget what it was, and I had to do that. I had to move way up on, the, on not on the tank in this case, but all the way up to the, to the very front of the seat. And for, you know, a lot of smaller stature you know, uh, people at women, uh, absolutely, you've got to work with what you got. Um, and small hands, you know, with the clutch, these things can be an issue. So you find a way to get make that work. Um, hopefully, you know, the whole thing about small hands is a, is a thing about, you know, the clutch, adjustable clutch, you know, or clutch and brake levers are awesome, but too many bikes don't have them. Like I know the 310 BMW, you know, it doesn't have an adjustable uh, uh, levers. Um, so find a aftermarket that has the right bend and so that you can at least get the two fingers in the little the little bend that comes in there. Great question. Thank you. And uh, Ralph Arias asks, uh, how do we set up a course, uh, a practice course in an empty lot? What's uh, your advice on that? Uh, if you can find one that has the standard um, parking lines, that is what I use. And I get my students to typically get to ride within two of them. Now I'm talking about a standard one because I just went to the, the elementary school right near here and there, there I couldn't do it. I could, I could do it in three, but I couldn't do it in two. So whatever the standard is, and I, gee, those UMSF folks out there would know this, but I haven't been a, an instructor for quite a while, but I'm pretty sure the width is, I'm not even gonna guess. I think for, uh, for bigger bikes, I think it was 22 feet wide. Um, I think that's what it was, 21. Uh, so if you want to do that, and, you know, Mark, just use the marks or, you know, sometimes you can bring something, uh, you know, uh, that you can measure and just, you know, 
um, bottle cap or something like that. Um, and if you want to do it that way, but you know what, it's just do the best you can at first, you know, and, and at some point, if you get the opportunity to, to measure it, great, but don't worry about the, uh, the tightness just yet. I mean, that's something that you work your way up to. Don't chase the, uh, the tight turn just yet. Just get the technique down, get it so that you can keep that bike steady and get it to lean as much as you feel comfortable, get it to turn and practice that, do circles both directions, and then at some point, then measure it, okay? But uh, do fig remember I mentioned before, do figure eights or do, if you do it to the left, be sure to do it to the right. Um, look in the center of your circle. If you're doing a circle, so look in the center. Some people might say keep your eyes up and stuff, but when it comes to tighter turns, it's okay to kind of have your eyes be more, they still have to be forward, but you don't, but don't look down, but you can kind of, if you're thinking about a circle, I tend to think about a cone in the middle of my circle. And that would be another way to do it. Put a cone up and circle around it. And uh, Ken, we got some feedback from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, Gloria Yanni says 24 feet and Jan, uh, Jane Van Stel uh, had it says one parking space is approximately eight feet. And Joshua Bumpus uh, says 20 by 60 is small MSF box and 24 by 70 is for big bikes. Excellent. I knew Josh would come in if he, if he was here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. uh, the next question up is from uh, John Hankey. And uh, he, uh, and you've talked about this a little bit. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping you could expand on it because it's something that I'm interested in too. He asks, uh, what uh, techniques work best for tight turns while standing on the pegs? Um, yeah, this is something that we work on um, when we do the ADV is standing on your outside foot peg. All right, so that's it. Everything else is the same. So while you're standing, you still do that, that little counter steer. Oh, there's something else I forgot to tell you about. Um, you counter steer and then you turn those handlebars. You have to have it be so that you can reach the handlebars and that you can let the handlebar turn in. Um, but the counterweighting part is, is um, important. Now, when you do that and you're standing, the right knee, if you're taking a left, goes into the tank or into the side of your seat. And the left leg, literally, you could take it, it, it opens up. So if I'm going in this direction, my, my right knee goes into the tank, my left knee opens up. So I'm going to actually face, my whole body is going to face the inside in the direction I'm going. And so that's going to kind of bring your knees into the, into the side of the seat. Uh, and then just the counterweighting. Uh, so one thing I wanted to uh, bring up before we go on, so I hopefully that answered your question, um, that I forgot to say is that if you've ever seen like a ride like a pro, um, Palladino, Joe Palladino, uh, he has this, this little technique that helps you to get into a, uh, uh, into a, uh, a U-turn quicker. And it's like the keyhole. So if you're riding this way and you're going around this way, if you just give yourself, if you have the room to do it, you just sort of swing your front wheel out and then this way, and it, it actually allows you to get into the lean earlier. So that's a little something that I meant to mention uh, earlier. Hey, next question. Jerry Palladino, motor man here. Right? Motor man. <laughs> and, uh, 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 Ken Kotz asks, uh, do you have any, this is uh, not on the topic for tonight, but a general question, uh, if you have any suggestions for bikes that have a tall first gear? Uh, I'll tell you, the Aprilia Tuono I just have, my track bike has a really tall first gear. You have to ride with the clutch just to like, you know, get around. When I get out of the, the pits to go on the track, I have to slip the clutch the whole the whole time. But that's my, now, the bigger question is really what kind of bike. And Ken, we're, Ken's going to be a student next week, and we can talk more about this. Um, but you, you'll find that a lot of, um, I don't know, it, they've changed them a lot. But you know, there have been certain bikes that have always been known to have really tall first gears that are Moto, Moto Guzzi's, and um, there's been some Harleys that have been mighty tall. But I think they've kind of come around a little bit for that. Um, so it ends up with tall gears. You do have to do a lot more clutch work you know, to really be smooth. You know, so we can talk about more about that tomorrow uh, next week, though, Ken. And uh, Ailton asks, uh, so the two parking spots seems to be the ideal goal uh, in order to know that you have it under control. Is that uh, is that pretty much uh, the consensus? If you can get it into two, that's good. But like Josh said, the MSF guideline is uh, 20, did he say 22 feet? 
uh, or 24. Anyhow, so you can, if you can get it in that, you're at least at a standard that's been established by the MSF. But those are kind of basic standards that if I can usually get a student to, to get between two parking spaces. Um, if you're a foot or two over, don't worry about it. But uh, if um, I think it was Gloria that said it was eight feet uh, wide is the standard one, um, then that's 16 feet. So measure it off. If you can do it in 18, yeah, that's good. And if you can do it in 20, that's the uh, what Josh was saying. That's the basic course. But they, you would think that that would be, um, you know, counter that you get the experienced people. They get a bigger area, but it's because of the motorcycle. Um, the, the bikes can't make the, the, the super tight turns. However, a good instructor who's um, who has practiced can take a full size motorcycle and get it done in tw in 20 feet. Like I say I usually I aim for 18 feet myself. And uh, Ken John Jarnigan asks, uh, and during counterweighting in a turn, is putting more weight on the outside peg doing the same thing? Yeah. If well, putting your foot on the outside, a weight on the outside foot peg, kind of naturally puts you in that position. Or the other way to think about it, if you're in the correct position, you will naturally weight the outside foot peg. That would be one way to think about it. So yeah, focus on that. And you can also think about it as weighting the outside edge of your seat. And it's just kind of the same thing. Let the bike lean beneath you. Okay. I'm a lot of, hey, John, I mean, a lot of people I know, a lot of ex-students and, and future students. I'm, I'm recognizing a lot of names. Thanks for coming. <laughs> it, uh... We have uh, we had uh, 47 people with us earlier, and uh, some people had to leave uh, because uh, it's uh, it's getting on during the evening, and I'm sure TV shows and bedtime is coming on. But uh, uh, Ken uh, Ken Kotz has another question, and he asks, uh, I, f I find U turns to the left are easier because I, f I I find it easier to drag the rear brake when weighting the outside foot peg. Any suggestions for dragging the rear brake when making tight turns to the right? Yeah, it's practice. That's why right hand turns are not, I'm not as, as good at them as, as left hand turns, uh, but it's about practice. There, um, I got another thing I wanted to talk about. The, uh, the other part about it with right hand turns is that you crowd your throttle. And so trying to keep that throttle steady because as you're turning the handlebar toward you, that also makes uh, right hand turns a little trickier. So those are two, two factors that can kind of make right hand turns a little harder. Um, but it's about practice, and we'll, we'll practice that next week. It, uh, here we have a question from Dawn Sedlier. Uh, I have a uh, Piaggio, uh, two wheels in front, one in the back, no throttle. Under five miles an hour, I can lock the suspension in the front and use it as a scooter. But as soon as I get it over 2,100 RPM, it unlocks the front suspension, and it's like a regular motorcycle. The question is, is how do I uh, how do I do slow riding without a clutch on this? Um, well, I, if I understand right, I've not ridden one of those, but uh, if I understand right, at 25, below 2,500 RPM and you have the front locked, it will remain locked. Now with, with that, you could really treat it like a, you know, like a spider or, a, you know, a Can-Am spider uh, or something like that, where you turn the handlebars and just steer it, um, but don't get it above 2,500 RPM. Which you shouldn't have to. When I'm revving my motor, I'm I'm really only bringing it up to, you know, 1200, 1500 at the most. So that's what I guess I would do. Um, just kind of treat it as a as a turn. If you want it to be, um, to learn to do it like a motorcycle, and, and so that it unlocks the, the wheels, then uh, there's nothing wrong with revving it up to to 2500 and let it unlock, and then and use these techniques we've been talking about. And uh, the next question is from Ken Graves, and uh, he uh, says, as far as the engine crankshaft speed factoring into stability, uh, will that hurt stability depending on the style of the engine? For example, an inline four with the crank perpendicular to the uh, chassis uh, versus a wing or a Valkyrie BMW with the crank in line with the chassis. That's very good. And also, like, I'll throw out a, um, a Moto Guzzi where you've got the V, you know, um, yeah, all those are gonna probably are gonna feel different. Um, I've not really found a uh, significant difference. It will, I mean, because you've got the crank going, you know, in a different direction. But uh, I've not really found that much of a difference. Remember, it's a slight uh, advantage uh, that stability that comes with it. It's not huge. Um, so, 
I probably just notice it. If you get the opportunity to, you know, to ride different uh, configurations, bikes with con different configurations of motors and do tight U-turns with them, let me know, you know, let me know what you find. Cause, uh, cause that's a really good question. You know, I know that it's there and I know that that stability is there. Um, but you know, that's a really good question. I will throw out those of you who are wondering, what's he talking about? Another example of that is when you see motocross riders, when they're jumping, they'll blip the throttle. And the reason they do that is to get the stability because they're not, they're flying. There's no stability from the wheels and they blip the throttle to get the crank to a uh, spin and it helps and they can actually help them to guide the bike. And uh, Ken, the next question uh, is from uh, Deenan uh, Squilante and uh, who is a registered uh, professional reporter a and uh, Deenan asks, where are you located, Ken? Do you do in-person training anywhere? Oh yeah, hey, thanks for that question because I have a company called Riding in the Zone and it's ridinginthezone.com and I'm in Western Massachusetts in um, the beautiful Berkshire Hills. So I train people all over the Northeast. Actually people fly in from other places too, but you know, with the whole situation we have, it's been really local people this year. And I do one-on-one -on -one and I do small groups. Um, and I usually do a parking lot, advanced parking lot course, but that's, uh, that's been kind of on hold this year. Although the way things are working, I might open one up. Anyhow, contact me, Ken, at ridinginthezone.com, and we'll talk. And uh, John Hanke asks, uh, <clears throat> this is a good question, how do I best save a stall when I'm standing? Uh, when you're standing. So that's a dab. So if you're talking about, uh, John, you're talking about standing as an ADV standing uh, while you're riding, is if it stalls, you have to drop to the seat and dab. Um, if I'm if I'm getting your your question right, um, and uh, squeeze the clutch because you will if if you can kind of it'll stall, but if the clutch is in, at least you're you're coasting, and it won't lurch you to 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 a fall. So that should be a, an immediate thing that you you know visualize it and then understand that if it stalls, get that clutch squeezed in, and then at least it won't be you know locking the rear wheel. Um, and then step down. If you're standing, just you got to go down. And that's one of the things we uh, work on with ADV is, is being able to dab. So you're, you're standing and then you go down and you come back up. So, you know, and if it comes to you need to, you know, keep the bike from falling over, you just sit down and just you just come right down and then, then your leg comes out and, and keeps your stability. And, and Ken, we've we've just about run out of questions, just about at the time that you wanted to end, which is about eight fifteen. And I, before you make your closing comments, I just wanted to remind everyone uh, to thank me, to thank Ken along with me uh, for uh, providing free content on an almost weekly basis, and so much great content on his uh, website, including uh, the great. Um, uh, the great uh, video content and his YouTube content and uh, all of the other great stuff. And uh, I, I would suggest that if you liked uh, the content tonight and all the other stuff that Ken does, uh, you could become a patron. Uh, just visit the uh, support page at uh, writinginthezone.com. Uh, where you could make a donation through uh, Riding in the Zone or become a patron by uh, going also to www.patreon.com. Uh, it's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Ken. I'll turn it over to you to make your closing comments, and uh, I'd like to wish everyone a really sunny weekend and uh, great writing. All right. Thanks, John. You've been, you've been awesome. I appreciate all the help. Um, yeah, this is, uh, you can see where you can, you know, toss a couple bucks if you would. Um, helps me to, um, you know, put these things on and to pay my, uh, you know, my internet provider and all that stuff. Um, I fully intend to uh, keep this stuff free and to keep it coming because I'm really enjoying it. Um, so that's, if you can't do it, I'm happy. That's fine. Just come. Love having you. So let's, uh, let's wrap this up. If anybody has any questions, uh, ridinginthezone.com. I've got hundreds of articles up there, uh, videos on my YouTube channel, lots and lots, racetrack ones, which is a lot of fun. I narrate uh, on the road uh, videos and also on the racetrack, and it really covers a lot of the stuff that I teach um, with, uh, with the training. Um, so that's it. I guess that's all.
Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you, uh, you being here. And I'll sign off. <laughs>